I am Zara Amer, and this is The Change, a podcast featuring stories about women, technology, and the Anthropocene. This project is an experiment, one that seeks to draw in an ever-growing climate conscientious public by starting and sustaining a mature, informed, and thoughtful conversation about the reality of climate breakdown while identifying the most impactful and scalable technologies that stand to considerably help the environment. The podcast is hosted by my friend, Antoinette Wilson-Marcus. Antoinette and I have received tremendous support from our partners and distributors, which we are very grateful for, and we are very excited to be bringing these stories to a broad audience. All views expressed are those of the person speaking and not their employer. Carla Mora is founder and managing partner of Alante Capital, a VC fund investing in innovative technologies that address climate change and enable a resilient, sustainable future for apparel production and retail. Alante invests in innovative technology startups that improve production practices, support mindful consumption, and recover and recycle apparel waste. Previously, Carla served as investment director at Vilcap Investments and associate director at the Elias Foundation investing in early-stage social enterprises in emerging markets. She worked on supply chain reform with building markets in Afghanistan and for the United Nations Sustainable Commodity Initiative for the coffee sector. In this week's interview, Carla shares her views on all things VC-related, such as the VC funding model, the VC power law, VC and female entrepreneurship, and all things climate tech capital. Which segments attract the most capital? Who is investing? where the biggest gaps exist, and why. And now I give you Carla. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Transformative adaptation, to me, it means the outcome of the work we're doing now. It's the clean future that we're building towards, where our daily habits and processes are no longer in opposition with our planet, but function in harmony with it. It will require systems change, but where systems change in the past has most often led to massive increases in productivity, this one will lead to increases in efficiency, phasing out waste from our systems and habits, and facilitating regenerative economic activity. So it will require some behavior change in the near term for sure, but to have transformative adaptation, behavior change will only be a small part of the solution. And really, we will have experienced a system change in a way that we produce, operate, and experience commerce and ownership. I believe that by cleaning up the production and consumption patterns across industries, we will make substantial headway and be able to meet consumers where they are, gently guiding them to towards better behavior as opposed to making everyone radically change habits from one day to the next. I've always been one to think differently and start from a problem and creatively figure out how to solve it, which is why I found a home in venture capital. I'm obsessed with human ingenuity and creativity and believe that we do have the capacity to rethink the way our systems operate under new environmental confines, which will lead to transformative change. And it's not going to be a few innovative ideas that lead to transformative adaptation, but new thinking and technologies that encourage positive behavior change and scientific breakthrough that slightly shift our systems over time until we're finally operating in harmony with our planet. Thanks, Carla. Tell us about your fund. What is Alante Capital's mission and investment ethos? Alante Capital is a venture capital fund investing in innovative technologies that address climate change and enable a resilient and sustainable future for apparel production and retail. So I started Alante with my partner, Leslie Harwell, um, to create a place for commerce, for entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors to come together and rethink how we operate and rethink an industry. And we started with the apparel industry for a number of reasons. We saw enormous opportunity. There are If you think about just the clothes you're wearing, there are so many steps that come into making that garment from the raw materials to how it's dyed and processed and sewn and woven. And all of those pieces um, have typically created a lot of waste, a lot of human exploitation in the supply chain. It's been a problematic industry and there's room for innovation everywhere. So when we saw that there was appetite for leaders of this industry, huge apparel companies looking for ways to do it better. We thought technology can be a big part of that. And so we started Alante to be able to 
spur that innovation and help lead to more innovation that can help the apparel industry radically rethink the way it operates and operate in a way that can be far more sustainable. On your website, it says that you invest across deep tech, clean tech, and enterprise software. How would you define the difference between those three technologies? And could you speak specifically to what they're trying to achieve? Yeah, we we do have a diverse set of business models that we invest in, including deep tech, clean tech, enterprise software. And it for us, we took this industry-specific approach, looking at how things are made, designed, ordered, worn, sold, recycled, all of that, and said, okay, what types of business models exist across this landscape of this industry that are able to receive venture capital that can scale massively to become relevant to all brands? And we were able to kind of create a ecosystem of um, startups. And within that, we were able to see that that primarily was clean tech companies, um, deep tech companies and enterprise software. We looked at also brands and some other business models and, and ultimately decided that they weren't the right fit for a VC capital, for our type of capital with our fund size, um, and really saw that these three kind of areas encompass most of what we can do. So clean tech is really, and we called it something different when we got started. It just, these terms evolve within the industry and it's, you know, we evolve with it, but clean tech to us is looking at innovation and it could be anything from a biomaterials company, creating new fiber, clean chemistries, um, you know, innovation that can help decrease waste out of manufacturing, all of these technologies that ultimately are helping to combat climate change in one way or the other. So they're not perpetuating the environmental degradation that persists currently with the incumbent technology. So that's where we're seeing clean tech. Um, there's a lot of that. We have three companies in our portfolio now that can fit within that space. Deep tech can also encompass clean tech, but because climate tech, clean tech is such a huge part of what we're doing, um, we we separated those two out. But deep tech, deep tech to us also incorporates some of the kind of future technologies that we are investing in now that um, especially start to improve our e-commerce experience. So we've invested in a fit technology recently that would be a deep tech company that enables um, customers to 3D scan themselves and get matched to garments. Um, exactly. The, the garment is matched as well. So that is one of the challenging pieces is being able to size a garment and figure out from like how it stretches, how it forms, how the seams fit, will it actually fit on your body? Not just here's your body as an avatar, you're a size medium. It's much more um, complicated and sophisticated than that. And so that's a deep tech solution that we're excited about, that we invested in, um, because it has the ability to decrease an enormous amount of waste that comes from e-commerce and returns, as well as provide data for these brands to start understanding their customers so that they can produce in a way that is accurate to what they can sell and stop overproduction, which leads often to incinerating their garments or, or just in creating tremendous amounts of waste. So um, that's a deep tech solution that has also a climate focus. Every investment that we make does have a climate focus. Um, yeah. And then software, I mean, we look at when we're thinking about behavior change in particular and how can we meet customers where they are today while influencing them towards better behavior, but within the confines of the, like, what they're willing to do. So rather than saying everybody just buy sustainable fashion, if it's far too expensive, we're looking for ways to mainstream it and make it more affordable. And, um, you know, there's a huge problem within the apparel industry of fast fashion and people just buying endless amounts of very cheap clothing to wear once and, you know, uh, get rid of it. And that throwaway fashion is a habit. It's a, a way that people wear. And so instead of only saying stop that, I, I hope everybody does stop that and start buying more timeless pieces, but that's not the reality of what's going to happen tomorrow. So we really started looking at rental models that could work to enable people to have an ever evolving wardrobe, but in a way where utility of that garment can far outweigh the environmental costs of rental. So um, that ends up being a software solution. We look at, you know, technologies that enable resale, rental um, as just two of them. There's others that we look at within that space. But 
Yeah. So that's how we get diversification for our fund. And we're not just a biomaterials VC. We're looking at at software, deep tech, kind of all across the board. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. Thanks, Carla. My next question for you is, is climate tech the new clean tech or are these entirely different investment categories? Well, I think climate tech is the new clean tech. And, you know, it's interesting because when we started, we, we called what we were doing clean tech. But then clean tech had a bad rap in the venture world from a while ago when a lot of clean tech investments didn't end up doing well and a lot of money had gone into it. So this was kind of like clean tech 2.0. And then climate tech became a, a term that people started using only recently. When we started, actually, we um, I had climate written a lot in, our, in my very first presentation and, and we had to take it out because we didn't want, it was a heated term at that time. Um, and in the United States and raising capital, we wanted to remove this political word in the United States and fortunate that it was a political word, um, remove that and get to kind of the heart of, of it. So we could get people from both sides of the political spectrum investing in a cleaner future without having to argue whether or not climate change was real, which was where we were at at that time. And luckily now that's not an issue. And so we're, we're comfortable and able to talk about, you know, the technologies we're looking at as climate tech solutions. I think climate tech encompasses more than clean tech did. And I think part of that is because innovation has continued and there's a lot more innovation um, happening that will enable a cleaner future across different industries and categories. Yeah. So the fashion industry is the third largest industrial industry in the world employing over 60 million people, 75% of whom are women. It's also the second largest polluter in the world, just after the oil industry, according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Your fund is singular in that it focuses on improving the labor rights of garment workers and the environment. How has fast fashion impacted the economic and environmental lives of poor women and children in developing countries? Well, it has affected it in a number of ways, massively. I mean, in one way, if we just look at the end of life of fast fashion, because that's part of it. So fast fashion is single-use plastic, essentially. So much of our fast fashion is made from polyester and synthetic fibers, uh, which end up in our environment forever. A huge reason why we have microfiber pollution um, everywhere that we're seeing right now, even in fetuses, uh, in women, which is just incredible that it's that pervasive. This is a huge problem with synthetic fiber and fast fashion creates an abundant amount of it. Um, and then it's not utilized. People don't wear it enough. It, it's so cheap that it's easier to wear once and throw away or if it rips or breaks or, you know, that it's not something that you necessarily invest in to fix or keep forever. So we have all of this, you know, we can absolve ourselves from that by delivering it to the goodwill and, and giving it to the secondhand store. But so much of that ends up in emerging markets. It's shipped out to either be downcycled and to become rags or sold on secondhand marketplaces in places like Ghana or, you know, all over the world in developing countries. And it, you know, starts to affect their local apparel manufacturing. So you have all this cheap American clothing, well, cheap clothing, really, um, that are ending up in these spaces. It, it affects their local business. A lot of it is also not being sold. So it's just transferring waste from one geography to another geography and putting the pressure on them to handle it. Um, so that's one side. And then when you look at the manufacturing side, you know, much of this clothing is produced and manufactured in emerging markets or poor countries where labor conditions um, <clears throat> aren't, aren't great, aren't able to be regulated as closely, um, or maybe there are regulations happening and there are third parties that are going and, and looking, but the way that we order, so this is putting it back onto the apparel brands, the amount of quantities that we're asking for and in the timeframes that we're requiring it is putting so much pressure on these suppliers who don't want to lose this great, you know, uh, customer that they start sending it out to secondary suppliers and third, you know, and that outsourcing is where a lot of the labor conditions are, the negative labor conditions happen. So that's where there are factories that are packed full of people that aren't ventilated, that, um, you know, 
famously have fallen down. People know about the issues with the apparel industry because of what happened in Bangladesh. Um, but it's, you know, there are problems that happen every day in, in that space. It's just a, a hugely problematic area. There's, um, you know, indentured servants and uh, children working within these in these supply chains, and it's hard to combat it within the way that it operates today. Um, so that's all problematic. But then in addition to that, there's just so many problems I could go into. Um, but in addition <laughs> to that, uh, a lot of the chemicals that go into making our clothes so that they don't um, shrink in the wash or that they don't stain as easily or they don't wrinkle as easily, like all of those finishing chemistries, um, they can be highly toxic. And in some of these areas where the women are working in the factories and working with them, um, they're breathing it, it's going into their water, it's affecting the water source and the, the communities living near it. Uh, famously, denim industry has been hugely problematic because we like to wear distressed denim. Everyone likes to have some cool distressed look to it as if it's vintage. But that, you know, with the dyes and the processing chemicals that go into making denim, when they're sandblasting it, all of those particles are going into the air and going into their lungs and creating huge problems. Levi's has done some great innovation in using lasers to create um, that look without having to do it in a way that is harmful and, and entering, you know, the bodies of these women working in the in the factories. Wow. It sounds like the asbestosis of our century. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Let's talk a bit more about the environmental impact of the fashion industry. More specifically, I thought we could talk about the toxic relationship that is fashion and water. According to the not-for-profit Sustain Your Style, one and a half trillion liters of water are used by the fashion industry each year. 200 tons of fresh water is needed to dye just one ton of fabric. And to put that into perspective, 750 million people in the world currently do not have access to clean drinking water. In most of the countries in which garments are produced, untreated toxic wastewaters, which contain substances such as lead, mercury, and arsenic, among others from the textiles factories, are dumped directly into the rivers. Plus, there is the problem of fashion and microfibers in our oceans. Every time we wash a synthetic garment, polyester or nylon, about 1,900 individual microfibers are released into the water, making their way into our oceans. Scientists have discovered that small aquatic organisms ingest those microfibers, and these are eaten by small fish, later eaten by bigger fish, introducing plastic into our food chain, as you referenced earlier about fetuses having these microparticles in them. How can climate tech help on this issue, if at all? Massively. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is a, an area I'm particularly passionate about. Uh, the very first investment we made is into an incredible company. It's called Mango Materials. It's run by three fantastic women from Stanford, scientists who, who developed this technology. Um, and it's PHA, which is a base polymer um, that comes from methane gas. So it's a bioplastic. They have figured out um, how to compound it and make it a melt-spinnable polyester fiber. So what they've done is created biodegradable polyester fiber um, that can actually provide the quality of regular polyester synthetic fibers. So, but when it gets released into our environment, as it does um, through the garment industry, it will biodegrade um, in marine and land environments. So we're really excited about them. They built this to combat the microfiber pollution issue. That's the passion uh, and driver of the CEO. She's um, massively committed to ending plastic pollution and came up with this really exciting uh, solution to do that. We invested in this company um, alongside two major apparel companies, uh, Adidas and Patagonia, uh, as well as a lot of other investors that are are now getting ready to do their next round and, and see them really start to commercialize. So we're going to be able to buy products with their fiber in it um, in the next year and a half or so. So that's, that's one. Um, we also look at, when you're thinking about water, I mean, there's a lot of innovation happening in that. There are waterless dyes that are being created. There are uh, solutions to put on fiber to make them absorb dye faster without having to use as much water. There are um, wastewater treatment systems that can recycle and use the wa same water over and over and actually capture a lot of the gunk, fiber dye, 
et cetera, so that they can handle that, that waste in an appropriate way. Um, we look at how do we, we think about water across the entire supply chain all the way to, you know, how are the fibers created? So looking at natural fiber, which seems to be the more sustainable choice. Um, but there's a lot of water and chemicals that go into growing cotton and growing other materials that go into, into our apparel industry. So we look at how can we decrease the dependence on virgin fiber? So we invest in recycle technology that can actually recycle post-consumer garment waste into fibers that can compete against virgin quality. Right now, the recycling technology is is not able to compete against virgin, so it always has to be blended. But the technology that we invested in called CERC is um, creating a solution where actually you can have a recycled polyester from polyester that you don't need to blend. And the cotton becomes a man-made cellulosic fiber like Tencel, uh, rayon, modal, lyocell. Uh, it's the wood-based fibers typically that come from our forests that can now come from our um, clothing through a very clean and closed loop process. So we're always looking at how can we decrease dependence on land use so that we can use our land to grow food and not grow clothes and save water in that. Hemp is a great, great opportunity for water savings. Um, I could go on, on and on. Water is a, a key component of what we see innovation uh, leading towards. That's really interesting. Thanks, Carla. So could you speak more broadly to how much capital is currently going to climate tech ventures and which segments are attracting the most capital? Sure. Actually, there has been an enormous amount of capital going into climate tech very recently. Since um, the UN did the Code Red for Humanity just a few weeks ago, there were a number of announcements of huge uh, funds, 4 billion growth equity fund uh, by General Atlantic was announced. TPG announced that they were targeting a 5 billion uh, for its new rise climate fund. Uh, Tons of smaller yet substantial climate funds were announced all within the last few weeks. Uh, And, um, you know, it's exciting. There's a lot of capital coming into this space. We're not, I'm not yet sure what exactly, what technologies it's going to go in towards, but we are seeing a lot more interest coming into the space where we are a lot, a lot more uh, investors that are interested in thinking about the supply chains of different industries um, and looking at kind of the less sexy behind the scenes processes in which we make things and not just brands um, across industries. So we're seeing a lot more interest in that, in, in those spaces, people wanting to invest in biopolymers. Um, recycling technologies, for example, just to name a couple. But yeah, it's it's really exciting. And you know, we're a small climate fund in this space. But when we got started about five years ago, we were still having to explain how investing with this frame to combat climate change would be a good financial investment. At that time, people still thought of it simply as impact investing, where they believed that it would be less financial returns with more social and environmental impact, whereas now we're seeing these huge funds coming in and creating these climate-focused, climate-tech-focused um, funds. They they are just making a statement that this is not just feel-good investments. This is massive economic uh, opportunities. Huge financial returns will come um, out of these spaces, and that's exciting because it's attracting a lot more capital. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you're seeing a lot more on the supply side. How is that affecting the demand side? Are you seeing more energy from people seeking venture capital investment in the right spaces? Oh, yeah. We have far more demand than we have supply. I wish our fund was four times the size. But when we got started, um, that pipeline wasn't quite as established. There weren't as many investable tech companies um, solving the problems in our unique thesis to warrant a massive large fund. However, we're already teeing up to do a much larger fund too in about a year and a half from now because we're just seeing the evolution of our space moving quickly. When we started, you know, we spent a lot of time helping our portfolio companies fundraise. Now we actually are getting a lot of inbound interest for our portfolio companies for future rounds. Investors are wanting to invest in Mango and Cirque and fit match and flip all the companies in our portfolio. And um, that interest has just changed a lot in 2021 in particular. We found it to be a little bit harder to get into some rounds. It was 
easy for us in the beginning. And now, you know, we're still able to get, get our seat at the table because of our specific and unique value add that we bring, but it's getting harder. It's getting more crowded and um, that's exciting. I'm happy about it. Yeah, that's fantastic. When it comes to carbon emissions, environmental degradation and the fashion industry, who's investing? Where do the biggest gaps in capital exist and why? Many of the leading apparel companies that we work with, this are brands like Lululemon or Adidas, The Gap, Levi's, um, Caring Group, VF Corporation. They are making very you know, bold public statements about becoming net zero, net positive, um, working towards decreasing water in their supply chain. And uh, these statements are now having to be backed up with action. And they're doing things. They're, they are investing. A lot of these brands are investing alongside us. Um, it's exciting. It's not going to just take their capital alone. But we're seeing some new thoughtful approaches to how to actually support innovation to create the solutions that these brands are going to need to be able to meet their meet their numbers and become net positive. Um, we do a lot of consulting work with different brands to help them understand what the biomaterials landscape is, for example, so that they can start to see if they switch out their elastane or their cotton or their polyester with some of these substitutes, how does that impact their carbon footprint? Um, and so we're we're just seeing that there's a lot more interest in thinking beyond just carbon credits and and thinking about kind of what is the future of addressing this issue look like in a much faster time frame. Before it was all of these commitments that were 10 to 15 years out. And we'll see if, if it all happens as fast as they're starting to say they want it to. But um, the fact that they're moving their deadlines to be closer is really a positive thing. It sounds like there's a lot more wider interest. So there's the traditional capital investment, but when you get the supply chain investing in its longer term sustainability in the way that you've just described, then you're starting to get a much more closed circle around that thinking, which is exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And we're helping to get these different actors that don't typically you know, invest with venture. So some of these brands, they have Vent, corporate venture teams that are doing this regularly. Other ones are investing off their balance sheet and trying to figure out, and and we're helping them see that it doesn't just take VC capital or corporate venture capital, where they might have the most impact in making the success uh, of these companies happen is through letters of intent to purchase, because that unlocks a lot of traditional capital that can unlock, you know, project finance for building these new clean factories. So um, it's, it's a systemic change. It's a lot of different types of capital that need to come in. Venture is one of them. Debt is another, you know, there are certain areas that are attracting a lot more capital than others because they're simply far more scalable and, and can maybe have a path to IPO. But some of these others that are critically important have a different type of exit opportunity for venture capitalists. And so it takes a more nuanced approach to understanding and diligencing these investments. Um, so we spend a lot of time with our co-investors who aren't as integrated into the apparel industry, kind of seeing those pathways for these less traditional VC investable companies. So we're able to attract all types of capital in, um, which is going to be what's needed in the near term. Does climate change cause more intense hurricanes? Why is Tyson Foods so bad for workers and the environment? How can vaccine distribution prioritize the Black and Latinx people who've been most vulnerable to COVID-19? Will pickup truck drivers go for electric Ford F-150? Fans of this podcast might also enjoy Got Science from the Union of Concerned Scientists, featuring guest experts who answer a range of science-related big questions. Available wherever you get your podcasts. So let's just talk a little bit about venture capital and the model around uh, around venture capital. And I'd like to get your thoughts on an excerpt from the Good Tech Lab report. It reads, venture capital is increasingly under scrutiny. The hyper growth VC depends on has several flaws. It does not suit most companies and turns startups into speculative assets. It can incentivize futile innovation and it often comes with hidden social costs. Overall, commonly available funding in tech and science have several blind spots. Companies driven by impact by science and which are not fit for growth at all costs. 
Would you agree with that assessment? And what other types of capital, some of which you did touch on, venture capital aside, are available for people working in the fashion climate tech space? That's a great question. When I was developing my VC fund, I was in San Francisco, so kind of the heart of you know Silicon Valley and, and where this all began. And I had to get out um, because I knew I wanted to create a fund that operated differently than the traditional VC model. I had had the privilege of working for Village Capital before this, and they have a, a very different style of um, VC. They don't do the power law dynamics that so many of the big funds are doing, and, and they had a really great model that kind of influenced a lot of my thinking. And so I left San Francisco, moved to Costa Rica, actually. My husband was on sabbatical. We spent a year down there kind of developing this concept. And um, it was basically to build a VC fund that did not operate in a lot of the ways that you were just mentioning. And how could we build a VC fund that would help to support the scientific innovation that would be required to create systemic change across industries? Um, and, you know, in the beginning, we had to learn a lot about what types of models could we invest in, what could we not, at what stages was VC the right type of capital when, you know, we have a, a tight time frame. If we have a 10-year fund, we have to get that money out to our investors at a decent um you know, IRR. And so it can't, if we invest too early and it's still years away from commercialization, then that could be really problematic. So we really learned a lot about our space to be able to identify where is there VC investable innovation happening that is both deep tech, climate tech, as well as our software, which is how we landed on all three of those. Um, and, and like I was just saying, we, because we've spent a lot of time doing that, we have a big pipeline of companies that fit that space. We share our due diligence often with our co-investors, um, bringing them into that so that we can start attracting the capital that would normally have more of that kind of power law dynamic into this, this area. And I'm happy to speak to examples of, of that. So the, the concept that um, many VC funds are focused on hyper growth, which leads to a lot of the negative outcomes that you had just mentioned, um, is a problem within venture. And one of the reasons I think it persists now more than it did before is we have these mega VC funds. They're enormous um, funds. They have a ton of capital. For them, it makes sense mathematically or more financially to invest in many companies with doing a smaller amounts of due diligence with the intention that, you know, a few of them will do incredibly well and become unicorns and the rest will fail. And as an entrepreneur myself, I don't want that type of capital. <laughs> I would love a VC to critically look at me and tear me apart and help me get stronger and invest only if they saw that there really was a true path forward to success and they wanted to be along that that journey with me. So when we were building our fund, we said we don't want to build a fund where, you know, 80% fail and 20% return the fund times five. We want to build a fund where most of the companies do well. And there are a couple that fail. Most of them do well and a few do great. And that's going to be the, you know, and they're maybe not going to be unicorns. Maybe we'll get lucky and have one, but that's not the intention of what we're investing. We're investing to create healthy, solid returns for a, a lot more without the expectation of being like an enormous, you know, IPO. We uh, do that through our process of really vetting these companies alongside their customers. So looking at these technologies alongside our brands, alongside Lululemon or Adidas, and really testing the technology to ensure that it works and make sure that the market is there and that the price is competitive and all of that before we're even making that investment. Um, and we have a lot of these experts from the apparel industry on our advisory council, and they're looking at things alongside us too. So we're really vetting these companies in a very thorough way before we're investing and making sure that as we model out their growth, it's aligned with the expectations from the founders, um, as well as, you know, we're more conservative than maybe what they would be modeling out because that's how we need to be responsibly diligencing them. But we can still see a clear line in sight for an exit within five years at a decent vertical. Oftentimes it's through acquisition in the types of companies that we're looking at. Um, 
So it's completely possible to be a VC fund that is thinking about um, this in a different way. And, and it just is a little bit harder to do. And thinking about the social costs that you brought up, I mean, that is enormous. And that's one of the reasons why we start this, started this fund, because even on these like impact type of companies that we're investing in that, that are addressing climate change and other social and environmental issues, you could be doing something with the greatest of intentions and create enormous negative outcomes. Because if you haven't thought about how, you know, what if that innovation takes off and becomes, you know, massively wide scale adopted, like what's going to happen to the output? What We have to, I mean, when we're diligencing, we're looking at the process in which the feedstock is cultivated, how it's transformed, what's going to happen at the end of life. How does it, you know, every step of the way, when we're looking at rental and resale, we're thinking about, is this actually increasing negative behaviors? And is the, um, you know, chemical process of cleaning the garments going to outweigh the environmental benefits? Like we're doing that analysis before we're even making an investment because we want to be sure that we aren't going to create some huge, enormous unintended consequence with the success of these startups. And we know the founder doesn't want that either. So that conversation comes early for us. Sounds like you're a unicorn among VC. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think so. Though there are a lot more funds like this that are coming out. Well, that's good to know because my next question is about that very problem, this concept of the VC power law in which gains follow a power law, so a trajectory where the financial returns of impact and climate tech investing benefit the already wealthy as the general public has too few occasions to participate in these. So that my question is, is there a phenomenon whereby this idea means that only the truly wealthy actually benefit from the process of venture capital investment? Because you have to have a lot of money to get into the game in the first place. And so only the wealthy benefit from investing in those things. I mean, I do think that Primarily, it's the wealthy that will financially benefit from venture capital. Um, but one thing that's been exciting to see over the last few years is the number of emerging managers that are coming into this space. And so what that I'm an emerging manager. These are people who may not have, they don't have a track record. They may not have even worked in venture capital before, but they see an opportunity for this type of capital to solve some problems and they go out and start a fund. And for those people, while it helps to be wealthy, you don't have to be. So, you know, I wasn't somebody that came from an enormous amount of wealth when I got started. And this will benefit, you know, me um, for my hard work if it's successful. Um, so, you know, there's a way, but like if you're just an LP investor into a venture, you typically, you, you have to be an accredited investor, which means you have a certain amount of wealth. Um, that isn't, you know, you can participate. The problem with venture capital is it's a risky asset class. And so if you're, you know, investing with a wealth manager, they're, they're typically going to steer you away from venture. So venture ends up being a portion of a portfolio of a, of a highly wealthy person who wants to kind of use this money in this high risk scenario, high risk, high reward, um, type of capital. And so in that sense, the returns will benefit the wealthy people who have the ability to be LPs in that sense. Um, but, if you're investing in companies like climate tech, like what we're talking about now, the people who are benefiting to me, I mean, yet maybe not financially, but are the people who are going to be the customers or um, end beneficiaries and users of the technologies in that firm. So for us, you know, yeah, the wealth coming from our investment in Mango Materials will go to the people at Mango Materials and the investors on their cap table. But the world will benefit from a, you know, biodegradable polyester fiber that can decrease, you know, microfiber pollution ultimately through less use of polyester. So we need venture capital, but it has not been a very inclusive industry. And I think that's beginning to change as we see my, more diversity in fund managers. Yeah. And as you've said, venture capital is one element of the wider capital provision network and it offers something to the recipients of that capital who would otherwise not be able to access alternative forms of capital and it gets those those ventures off the ground. What was the fundraising experience like for you when you launched your own fund and what motivated you to do so? 
Well, I did spend about a year trying to convince myself not to launch a fund. (laughs) Um, And I just saw this opportunity and it felt like kind of the culmination of my entire work experience and passion. I had this opportunity to take all of that and put it into a fund. And I had always come from this thesis that we could make a better world if we just were able to think outside of the box and invest in the types of innovation that could enable us to get there. What I was talking about in the beginning with transformative adaptation. And I wanted to prove it out that we could do that within a system. When I first started working in impact investing, I'm a development economist before I was ever a venture capitalist. So I was working, you know, UN projects and overseas and, um, yeah, working on economic development. And I, when I moved into impact investing, it was all of these kinds of solutions. We were, we were investing in social enterprises that weren't massively scalable or dealing with the underlying issues for why the problem persisted. So as a development economist, that was frustrating to me. And I wanted to get back to that systemic problem. What was happening that was creating negative environmental and social outcomes? And can we look at doing that differently, um, internalizing the negative externalities, if you will. So for me, when I saw the opportunity to do that in apparel and venture capital could be my way to do that, that's why I became a venture capitalist. I wasn't always like, I want to be a venture capitalist and I want to be really rich one day. It was more like, I need to prove that if we can you know, invest in the right types of innovation, work within an ecosystem, we can change the way that people produce consume and like how things are produced and make it more in harmony with our planet. And I'm going to prove that out first with apparel because there was a huge opportunity to do that. Um, so that's what got me kind of started down this path. But fundraising is is hard. I mean, it's always hard, but it's really hard for emerging managers. And we definitely, uh, my business partner, she's amazing. She came on board from JP Morgan. They were investing in venture funds. So she knew quite a lot of about fundraising and and knew a bunch of potential LPs. So we, you know, had that as we got started and she's great at that role. Um, But it's tough to do without, we, we didn't actually even realize that just what it meant to be an emerging manager with your lack of track record, like how substantial of a hurdle that really was going to be. We've had a lot of investors say, we love your thesis. This is truly unique, really exciting. We love like that you operate within these brands but we just don't invest in emerging managers come back for fun too. I mean, we already have so much capital soft circled for our next fund, yet we're still working on closing our first fund. Um, And so that's been tough. And I think in the beginning, it was hard to be taken seriously as a, you know, female fund manager in fashion um, because, you know, while we're in the fashion industry, we're not investing in, in apparel brands or like artisan brands we're investing in climate tech, we're investing in biopolymers and, you know, different software solutions. And so to be able to communicate that to get the LPs we were after who were vast majority were were men in their fifties, sixties, um, to take us seriously was, was tough. Um, but we learned how, and while we were learning how the entire investment market started changing as well, BlackRock announced, that, you know, they needed that, you know, if you're not thinking about climate as a risk factor, then you're not being a smart investor. And when that happened, people started thinking about our strategy differently. It wasn't like a cute impact fashion company anymore. It was like a climate tech solution for a huge, massive industry. And then things started to flow. We've learned a lot over the last few years, um, but fundraising for me is never fun. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's fine, but I can't wait till this fund is closed you know, our portfolio is doing great and they're going to continue to. And so as we have that track record to show, fund two will be massively easier to fundraise, but it's definitely not for the thin skin. (laughs) No, it sounds like a real challenge. Uh, Speaking a bit more broadly, according to Atomico's report on the state of European tech 2018, in Europe, VC-backed tech companies with all-male founding teams received 93% of the capital invested and account for 85% of deals. 5% of capital goes to mixed teams and only 2% to all-female teams. More recently, in 2019, Crunchbase stated that 2.8% of funding went to women-led startups, but in 2020, that fell to 2.3%. 
Why are women-led startups in tech and climate tech so often undercapitalized? What most of the literature would say about that and what I do think I've experienced is people fund what they know. And so if you have a funder base that are primarily white men, they're going to, you know, that went to Ivy League schools, they're going to invest in people who remind them of themselves when they were younger. And they want to back them. They want to see them succeed. And maybe they understand them quickly or they communicate in a way that makes sense quickly. Um, And if you're being pitched by an entrepreneur that comes from a different background or, you know, a different school education, different city, all of that, it's maybe going to be harder for you to open your mind and listen to them properly and ask the right questions and get... For me, that's not a challenge. I am not a typical VC. And so I'm having the same challenges as these entrepreneurs. For me, when I'm being pitched, um, you know, I, I've noticed I have a bias towards women. So I find that I communicate really well with women. And I've helped a lot of our female, female uh, CEOs fundraising. And I've noticed, uh, you know, in compared to some of our male portfolio companies that are having similar types of models, they've had a hard time because they don't speak in the same way. It's as if like, you know, they're not speaking with blind confidence, even though they are very confident, but they will bring you up to speed with exactly where they are. And they are detail oriented and they will talk about the problems in a more open way. And I love that. It brings me on board. It makes me feel like there's trust and I can like understand those problems. Because if you tell me that there's no problems, I tell you, you don't know your own business because there's always problems at this stage. Um, So, you know, and so I think that for me, what I actually had to get over was bias against privilege. So when a founder would come to me that I felt came from a position of massive privilege and maybe didn't have to work as hard to get to where they got, I would question whether or not they had the grit to get to where they need to go. And so while that could be like a, they could find it easier to fundraise from a different investor who saw them and said, that's just like me. I was seeing it as the exact opposite. And so my partner and I were like, okay, well, we don't want to perpetuate more bias, you know, we towards whoever it is. So what's going to be our policy? So we always take a second call. So that's, that's how we do it is when there is a portfolio or a pipeline company that fits within our thesis and is interesting, it's like fits our priorities of the time. Um, you know, we have that first call and then we have a second call because the first call, there's always a power dynamic that is a little off. I'm the one with the capital. They're the ones looking for the capital. Um, so, you know, we get through that, we get to know each other a bit. And then in that second call is where we really start to kind of decide whether or not we want to work with this person and whether or not we like this idea, et cetera. Um, just because we really wanted to make sure that we were being aware of our own personal biases. In our portfolio, I don't know if this is okay. You can add this or you you don't have to, but, um, when we started thinking about inclusivity in venture, um, you know, as a female fund manager, there's a big gender lens movement. That's what it's called. Women investing in female ventures, women investing in, um, fund women led funds etc and and we were you know getting a lot of pressure from that community to have a very bold statement around gender like we are investing in women and for us that wasn't what we set out to do i wasn't here to only invest in women i'm i'm here to invest in the best technologies that are going to solve the the problems for this massive industry that does impact women um and it impacts all of us and i want to make sure that we are casting a broad enough net so if you are looking at only the typical channels, maybe Silicon Valley in New York and certain accelerators, and you're, you're seeing that your pipeline of opportunity is vastly male, then you're not casting a broad enough net. And so what we decided to commit to was instead of saying we're going to invest in 100% women-led companies, we said we are going to build a pipeline of at least 50% women or minority founders. And we believe it's our assumption that with looking at diverse companies, it will lead to a much more diverse portfolio. Fast forward to now, we have seven companies in our portfolio and uh, 100% of them have females on the executive team and all the, or females or minorities on the the, the executive team because we just invested in a company that's just female founders, um, but they are 
minority. Um, yeah. And so it's been a hundred percent of our diversity metric is our portfolio now. So that's been really interesting. And also really interesting, the extent to which you notice the, the trend for us to be biased too, as women, exactly what you said, we automatically are attracted to people who are like ourselves and you have to make a conscious decision not to let that bias play into your decision-making. And so it's fascinating that you yourself had to come to that realization. So my next question is about sacrifice. And here we are speaking to the sacrifices women make for their careers and or their families. According to UNICEF, women reinvest 80% of their income into their families, while men invest only 30 to 40%. And you personally went four years without taking a salary while you've been setting up Alante. The people who've been defining the climate sector over the course of the last 10 to 20 years have had to make some very real sacrifices. And yet this culture of sacrifice hasn't seem to have made it into the climate vernacular. It's been superseded by the innovation culture, which takes the center stage when it comes to the climate narrative. Some of us have at best a second degree connection to innovation, either by default or by proxy. And a few of us have a legitimately strong personal connection to it. But everyone everywhere has a relationship to sacrifice. So why don't we hear more about that? That's a really... Great question. Um, I had the opportunity to go to a event recently. It was a virtual event that brought GPs, so investors and in, investors of funds, fund managers and LPs, investors in funds together in one room. And they were um, getting to hear the LPs were getting pitched all of these different funds, but then also hearing about sacrifice and hearing and it was all female fund managers. Um, and it was really inspiring and, and amazing to, to hear these women's stories because they were so similar to mine. Yet while I was going through mine, it felt very isolating. And um, I didn't know other people who were going through the same experience as I was as an entrepreneur of a venture fund because, you know, I've worked in working with startups for about a decade now. And if you're starting a company there are a lot of resources for you, accelerator programs and loan programs and business plan competition. If you're starting a VC fund as an emerging manager, it's, I'm a startup entrepreneur of a fund. There aren't a lot of resources for you. There aren't accelerator programs. There's one that I know of now, a couple that are starting to emerge this year, but like four years, five years uh, too late for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, so that experience was really uh, personal. I had to you know, I had got married the year I started this company. And so I had to, you know, talk to my husband and figure out, you know, I had a great job before I, I left it to do this and say, Hey, you know, can we live off of our new income and how do we want to set up our lives? And, and, you know, are you going to have like, you know, figure that out. I mean, you really have to have a partner, whether it's your partner or a friend or a family member, who's going to be able to be like your confidant and, help you stay positive when things get really hard and, you know, ask you about your day and meetings because you don't have any employees. And it's just like all of these things. My husband was my real, really my first coworker. You know, he remembered all the names of everyone I met with and asked about it. Um, so there's a significant sacrifice, not to mention, you know, we were newly married and wanted to think about having a family. And I, we waited a long time to get married. We, you know, just, in terms of age, it was like, uh, well, am I having kids or am I not? Because I don't have the, the opportunity to wait a whole lot longer. Um, so, you know, I had a, a son uh, who I, I had my baby when we were still fundraising before we had our first close. We had our first close the week I came off of maternity leave. It was like holding my little, you know, infant um, while we closed our capital, made our first investment into mango materials. And he you know, was at home with me. I was working from home and, you know, as an, at the infant age, it was actually really quite not that hard. <laughs> he, he took a lot of naps. I could, could pull it off for the first year and a half of his life. Um, but then the pandemic hit and my husband came home, thank God, and was working from home. And, you know, my son was at home with us because it was too dangerous to go to preschool yet at that point. And so basically I let the first two years of my company uh, with my son next to me at home. <laughs> that was a huge sacrifice. It was hard and it was exhausting. And having to, you know, just every second of, of my life was either parenting or work, um, losing myself in that 
And now I, I'm finally at a stage where he's in preschool down the street and life is easier and I can run my fund and also go to yoga and so like take care of myself a little bit and go on date nights and everything. But, you know, there's a lot of personal um, sacrifice that m- myself and my husband did. And, you know, it's all been worth it for sure. And we're, we were on board with that, but, you know, people don't really hear a lot about kind of that side, especially when you're in the, the capital holding space. Like I'm the one with the capital. So everyone expects that it's because I came from wealth or it's my personal money. Um, but you know, the path to get there was not quite that simple. It sounds like you've had a very challenging time. So it's great though, to hear that people believe passionately as you do about what they're doing. And it's, yeah, it's very inspiring. And while it's been, you know, challenging on the personal front, it's also been really uh, fulfilling because I am doing what I feel like is what I'm here to do and seeing so many positive things come out of it. You know, we've been able to create a lot in just a few years outside of just fundraising, the portfolio companies, but our relationships with the apparel industry and of what we've learned over these years and just seeing it working is such an um, inspiring thing for me that keeps me going no matter what, no matter if it gets difficult. And I mean, I'm in California. During this time, there were also massive fires. There were floods in my hometown that killed a bunch of people. There have you know, Before the pandemic, there have been so many climate disasters And while that is so massively depressing, working in this space, I'm always optimistic because I get to to talk to entrepreneurs solving these very problems. So it really, I feel very lucky to be able to have that opportunity during these challenging times. Yeah, I can see that. So I have one final question for you. Circling us back to the beginning when you made your statement on transformative adaptation, because in a way you you touched on this in that statement because you said that how we think about transformative adaptation needs to be systemic and that it behavioral change flows out of that. But my question is, to what extent is the elephant in the room here demand? Can fashion ever be sustainable unless people in the developed world start taking more responsibility for the crippling interest that the most vulnerable people living in the poorest, hottest parts of the world pay for our lifestyle and consumer choices? Honestly, the fastest way we can fix some of the negative impacts of fashion is if everybody went to therapy because (laughs) shopping habits (laughs) are so out of control. And when people, it's just shown, like when there's depressions um, in like economic depressions and recessions, clothing purchases go up just like alcohol goes up because it's like this quick reward, this, you know, you feel good because you got your Amazon package that day. And, um, you know, so it's, it's tough to just tell people stop doing that. They all need to start thinking about it. And I think we're raising awareness about our behavior. Why are we behaving this way? Do we really want this? Are we going to wear this long-term? Is it just this momentary happiness? Is there a way I can get that in a different way? The way we think about it from a venture capital perspective in in making investments is, you know, yes, I want people to wear timeless classic wardrobes and only rent the clothes that they need when it's for a party and they're going to wear it once and all that. But like, we have to meet customers where they are and guide them towards better decision making. That's our role versus, you know, there's the activists and the media that can put that other societal pressure that can help lead to more behavior change. We've seen regulation around plastic use, single use plastics, especially in California, create massive behavior change. You know, the everybody brings their own reusable bag because they don't want to spend a quarter on the bag or whatnot. Like that really worked. Um, same with straws. So and then that leads to more innovation to create re- like realistic solutions. One of the companies we're investing in now, they create the plastic bags that all of our stuff shows up in when we order online, the poly poly bags, um, and also shopping bags, but from a regenerative feedstock. They're using algae to be able to create it. So it's deacidification of the oceans. It's it's huge carbon capture on that front, creating healthier um, economic opportunity on coastal communities and emerging markets, and creating an affordable drop-in solution to a plastic waste problem. Um, so we look for those types of solutions where in the end, it's still this like single use plastic bag um, that a customer is going to use, but 
at least it's something that is actually creating a regenerative, you know, it's, it's removing carbon from its feedstock instead of creating carbon in its production. So, um, you know, that's what I mean by meeting customers where they are is like it, through innovation and technology, we can create substitutes. So our behavior is not as harmful while trying to increase better behavior patterns like ownership. Access over ownership has been a big thing in other industries. We don't own music anymore. We access music through Spotify or Apple Music or whatnot. Um, same with, you know, TV. And we, we, the way that we're consuming all kinds of things is different, even with like Airbnb and we're renting out our houses and it doesn't feel as much as ours. It's this economic engine. We can rent out our wardrobes and there's opportunity in that where there is a, a huge amount of utility increased in that garment. And so less garments are needed. More people are using the same thing through these different models. And that's, we're seeing that happening in other places in other industries and not moving into fashion. And that's really exciting. So these small incremental changes will lead to a systemic change. In the meantime, we're going to be working on the back end and looking at how can we create all of this stuff without creating as much damage. Um, so that, you know, when you are buying your fashion, it's at least not as harmful though. Absolutely. Customers should be held responsible. We need to decrease demand overall. Um, and that, that is changing not as fast as we need it to, but like as a VC, I can't rely on behavior change. That's not something that's too big of a risk for a lot of the types of companies I want to invest in. So I want to like see trends of behavior changing, and then I'll invest in a technology that helps push that trend faster. Um, and that's kind of how we look at it. Great. Carla, thank you. It's great that there are people like you and investors willing to go out on a limb and make the sacrifices that you make. And it's been so fascinating talking to you. It was my pleasure, Antoinette. It was nice to meet you. Thank you for tuning into our very first series. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe. And since we're a new show, please, please, please circulate our information with your friends, family, and colleagues. Extra points if you subscribe and throw us a rating.